Hello. Um, this, who uh, you know, it's Martin House, and um, we are very happy to have him in the techno shamanism meeting because he is our alchemist, and he will talk uh, about this uh, after the workshop. He will talk about these things on the radio program, and now we can have this uh, demonstration. Uh, moment. So, yeah, Martin, thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, if you want, maybe you want to come a bit closer. Oh, it's not so dangerous because it's like a so, so, it's kind of like a mixture of. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> i just start and I'll see what um, what happens. So, it's more or less it's something which I've not okay where to start was the question it's something which i've not tried on this scale before like normally well the last time i tried this so it's kind of one experiment which is part of an ongoing exploration which is what i call dissolution which is based more or less on medieval alchemy and something which is called the the green line which is from this uh like poem by Victor of Moulton called The Hunting of the Green Lion. This is from, I think, 16th century. And this is part of what was collected in the Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum, which is like a later anthology of medieval English alchemical verse. So what is interesting is that all of the people writing in this book were alchemists from, I guess, around like 14th, 15th and 16th century. They're all from England and they all wrote in verse, so that it's all poetry, which somehow relates to these things which are on the table. <laughs> so the idea, um, I'm going to read a bit from this, but first of all, I'll explain a bit about this idea of dissolution. So, how to say, it's kind of a long story, maybe I'll talk about it a bit later. Um, but one thing I'm interested in is to look at how cycles which relate to technology, or techno technology considered as something which is not natural, not part of a natural cycle, how technology enacts certain cycles, and how alchemy, which was coming before technology, as we consider technology in terms of computation and things like this, um, electricity and so on, how alchemy was in some ways foreshadowing a kind of technological approach to the world by attempting to somehow improve on nature. So taking, following in the footsteps of nature. Um, so you have these, so a lot of alchemy is either expressed in verse or expressed in emblematic, um, do we have any emblematic drawings? <laughs> um, so either expressed in verse or in these kind of emblems which can be, uh, that's not particularly, <laughs> but these kind of emblems where you would have, for example, in terms of the green line, where you have one of the most famous alchemical, aside from the Ouroboric snake in its own tail, which is from like third century Egypt, which is probably the most famous alchemical symbol expressing some kind of idea of cycles. You also have the, which I have with me, um, the green lion, which is the green lion, <laughs> eating the sun. And the blood of the sun is then flowing into the earth and somehow nourishing the green uh, line. So this is this kind of very famous emblem which is also expressing some kind of cycle and one potential interpretation of the green line eating the sun is the green line represents some kind of chemical agency which is developed by the alchemist, ourselves in this case, <laughs> um, which we'll attempt today, and the sun is gold. So this is, the green line is something which is able to eat gold and return some kind of red blood substance which is then used within a further kind of alchemical cycle. Um, so I don't know whether anybody has any technological objects which can be dissolved by the green line today, but I also have some gold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is a kind of easy, and again it's not kind of guaranteed it will work because it's kind of, um, whoops. Uh, none of these 
kind of recipes are very precise and it's also worth, I mean it's also a huge subject so I'm not going to talk too much now, but it's also worth remembering that this is just one tiny part of the whole kind of alchemical work which would last for years and years and years. So this is the part where I've extract, extracted, so to say, um, relating to the green line but also relating to this idea of dissolution which is in very simple terms to attempt to use materials from the earth which I'll kind of go through in turn to return technology to the earth. So to start with a cycle which is um, of extraction. So what we're going to use, uh, and feel free to ask any questions if it's not clear. So the elements which we use and what are, in some ways this is a kind of quick, very quick version of what I've done in the past because otherwise it would take weeks. <laughs> so what we have is uh, saltpeter. This is in this bag here. So this would be extracted from uh, chicken, horse, dung, uh, human urine, and then this would be recrystallized from that. So this was a common practice in 17th, 18th century to have these kind of farms of saltpeter because it was used in the production of gunpowder. So it was very profitable to produce this, which is now worthless, <laughs> more or less. It's used as fertilizer. So this is otherwise known as potassium nitrate in the kind of chemical terms of so saltpeter, which would be used to my notes here, would be used to produce in alchemical terms aqua fortis, because it's a very strong acid. So all the acids have which is a nitric acid in modern chemical terms. So from this we produce so we go from chickens towards nitric acid using this. So that's kind of one, so beginning with the earth and the chickens, we arrive at this nitric acid, but nitric acid is not able to dissolve gold. Okay, so that's one question. So this does not represent the green line in its kind of acidic form, because it cannot be gold. But if we add the nitric acid to <laughs> spirit of salt, this, well this is salt, but from this we can make spirit of salt, which is hydrochloric acid. So we have salt, and when we've done this before, we've actually collected like sea or harbor water and evaporated it to the salt. So the idea was that all of these things would come from the sea and from the earth, but they would be able to dissolve gold and technology to return it to the earth, to make this kind of cycle, which at the same time mimics and mirrors the cycle that's going on anyway, that you extract gold from the earth to make technology, which then is returned to the earth as obsolete technology. Okay, so that is the salt, spirit of salt. So if we combine those two, then we can get what is known as aqua regia, or oil water, which will dissolve gold, um, which could be the green line, but it's, the problem is it doesn't fit with certain things that the green line does. And nobody actually knows what the green line is, but that's the only thing which can eat the gold is the green line. Oh, is that clear? <laughs> um, and there was something else which was kind of interesting. What was I thinking? In and when I say that it's like dissolving gold, what it is is more or less putting the gold into solution. So this is where it forms part of the alchemical process because you want to somehow get to this kind of like prime matter of gold, which is not the solid substance, it's somehow what is called like philosophical gold. So you have this golden solution, which then you're able to do more things with it because it's how to say, like, you've opened up the gold to be able to manipulate it. So this is something which is outside <coughs> nature in a way. Like, you find gold in nature <coughs> as ores. It's not mixed with anything else. And then um, you can't do anything with this stuff. So you need somehow to make it volatile or somehow spiritual or philosophical. And then the third element we have, <coughs> or we need two more elements. So this is another... Um, uh, substance, <laughs> uh, which is iron pyrites that you might be familiar with, um, which is kind of like one of the most common minerals on Earth, and it's kind of quite it's mined in quite large quantities, but it's not useful. So it's just like a waste product of mining that then is kind of littering mining sites mixed with other minerals. And what is interesting is that when rainwater flows through this uh, rock or mineral, um, 
through some kind of bacterial agency, it starts to convert this into something else, which was known in medieval times as vitriol. Uh, What's its name again? Iron pyrites. Okay. So it turns into like iron sulfide. And so what will happen is, so what I've done is kind of like artificially weather this with water over several months. So it starts to develop this kind of whitish, greenish thing. Like normally it would be like gold looking, but you have these kind of, and then some bits at the bottom of the bucket, which are here. Yeah. So this is um, iron 2 sulfide, I think, which is otherwise called vitriol, which is also a very important element within medieval alchemy, um, which would kind of even use like the vitriol, was used as a kind of, how do you say, where the first letter spells out an expression, like some kind of. Not an anagram, but a, what's the word for that? Acronym? Yeah. And I can't remember the whole thing because it's in Latin, but it starts off with like visita interior terra, and then it's about discovering and working with what you find in the middle of the earth. So vitriol is also, like vitriol could also be perhaps the green line because it is green and you form like a green. So what would happen, so the water, what's kind of interesting, I'll finish quickly, is that the rainwater washes through this changing it over a period of years or months through this kind of bacterial agency. But as the rainwater washes through this iron sulfide, you start to get sulfuric acid being produced, which is in medieval terms called oil of vitriol, which is like another acid which can work on metals, but also not on gold, which is also a question as to why it would be the green dragon that's not able to work on gold. But also the interesting thing is that this relates to the subject of technology in terms of that this is the prime, I mean, this is not the cause, but this is an agent within what is called like acid drain water or something like this. So this is why you have in a lot of mining, particularly gold mining, let's say in Czechoslovakia or so on, you have a lot of acid <coughs> spill into the um, rivers and streams and groundwater, which is actually not because, like at first, well, my first thought was that these acids just come from some industrial process, which is refining the gold, but the acids are just produced as a byproduct because you've pulled all of this to the surface, the rainwater goes through this, so it's like another kind of cycle, but a different kind of destructive cycle. So this, these are the elements, but we need, I don't know, we do it that way. So what I'm going to try, um, I'll read quickly from this, <laughs> two, two parts, because they're kind of interesting, and it also gives you an idea of what medieval alchemy, how it was expressed. And then we need to dry some of these elements that we use because they're too wet. And then what we're going to attempt is what's called like a dry distillation into vapor and acid. So this is, which is kind of a key to this whole kind of cycle that I'm interested in. And medieval alchemy is that you're converting these kind of solid minerals, you're somehow releasing their spirit because they become vapors at high temperatures, and then the spirit is being condensed back into a liquid which can then extract something from minerals, so kind of take some, so it's in some ways it relates to the whole topic of this thing, which is relating to animism, which is that you're actually somehow reviving these uh, substances. So this is kind of also what I'm interested in when I spoke, this thing that I wrote quickly about subjecting this gold to some kind of angelic breath, because it's also relating to a lot of medieval alchemy is that you have this spirit which is what you're extracting from these things. So it's, in some ways this is a kind of interesting thing that alchemy is neither spiritual nor, well, again, it's a long subject matter, but so there's kind of one viewpoint which was from the 19th century to let's say 1960s, 1970s, was that alchemy was just veiled in this language of materials but was really about spiritual progress, blah, blah, blah or religious progress, or religious development, let's say. And then more recently you have the other view, which is no, if you actually read it really carefully, it's about these were proper chemical processes they were undergoing. They just were expressed differently. And this is also what I was trying to say with the emblem. So if we have an emblem, which is um, a grey fox eating, no, sorry, a grey wolf eating the sun, again, so you have lots of things eating the sun, or a king bleeding or something like this, so the king is a lot of, they change the symbols, so if the sun is gold, the king is gold, 
sometimes grey wolf is something called antimony, which is a very popular mineral, but it's all expressed in these, you know, if you have something jumping over the grey wolf, and then if you have an eagle flying up, this is quite often to do with the distillation process where you have uh, vapour rising here, and then you would say the eagle is flying to the snowy mountain. I mean, this is all true. memory so, <laughs> Which would mean that the vapour is rising up, and then you would have something which is looking like snow, like some crystalline substance here. So it's kind of like you can go through all these stages, because a lot of this stuff is written in like 12 or 16 stages, and if you don't see it at that stage, let's say at stage six, <laughs> you don't have the snowy thing, then you know that something's gone wrong, so you have to start again. Okay, so what we'll start off with is maybe put on... The <laughs> I've never done this in this uh, So that's the furnace. <laughs> so this is a very light... <laughs> The other thing is maybe it's a good idea to open the window. Okay. Just because also some of the fumes will be... <laughs> and maybe turn this down a tiny bit, because what I want to do is just to try and... Turn it down. It's just to try and dry... Um, So what we'll try is like a distillation which is going straight to the um uh I have to check this is not the counts. We can try two two different experiments. So the first one is a kind of quick root, which is using the potassium nitrate. Which again, so like what we've done before, and also we work with a furnace outside because you can't, this will be on a very small scale. <laughs> um, what I need is some way of measuring our scales, which doesn't really make so much sense. Um, Spin with me. So let's say it's about that much. No? Two fingers. So this is the potassium nitrate. And what you would do is more or less take this like horse dung or chicken shit, which has been lying around for a couple of years in a cellar or something like this. You would take that, boil it in water for a few hours. Which obviously why I can't do this here. Um, and filter, filter it and then evaporate the liquid, and then you would have these white crystals, which are this potassium nitrate. So it's not... So this is the kind of... This is more or less like a cheap... Not really, but <laughs> it's the quick version. So we have the potassium nitrate, then we're going to use now the one thing I didn't introduce, which is ammonium chloride, which could be extracted from air, for example. So these are all things which can be... You know, they have a earthly... They're not synthetic. Um, is this going to be... Maybe Shall I bring some kind of spoon? Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> so this is... I mean, there are kind of lots of different routes. So another... Like, if this does anything, we can also try the other route, which is to add salt to a distillation of the vitriol and the saltpeter. But we'll just try this because this is kind of... I tried this once and I did... Uh, none of this is... There might be some kind of fumes which are not so nice, but because the quantity is a very... Um, that's about right now. More or less. <laughs> and it's not going to be... <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? So, like, normally, or when I've done this in the past, we've used, like, a wood furnace outside, or, like, a charcoal, like, self-made charcoal furnace to get high temperatures, and you would use, like, a kind of litre 
kind of round vessel, so it's holding like you know quite a lot of this stuff. So this is kind of like the mini version, which also using butane, so it's kind of accelerated. So it's probably more or less like the opposite of real alchemy, in that you're supposed to meditate and do things over you know, long periods of time. But it's just a kind of proof of So we're just going to dry this, so we're just trying to get the water off because it will have some water. <laughs> now the only kind of risk in the whole process is that the, the glassware should go to quite high temperatures. But because it needs to get very, I don't know, we need to go to maybe five or six hundred degrees centigrade and the glass can either shatter or develop like a small hole which will then let a lot of gases out. So that's the only risk. So that's why we have these goggles for the audience <laughs> that you can show. <laughs> okay, so while we're... What do we need now? So what I'm going to do is to read like two parts from the hunting of the green, not very long parts because it's more or less, let me just see. But it also gives you an idea. Yeah, I think it's going a bit far, it? it gives you an idea of how these things are. This is not so long. Just how the thing is written, and so it's maybe eight pages long, but I just read two passages. So this is the beginning here, which is more like this introduction. And you have to excuse me because it's also a bit in, let us say, in old English, kind of. <laughs> so, all hail to the noble company of true students in, no in holy alchemy, whose noble practice doth them teach to veil their secrets with misty speech. So this is kind of the first thing in terms of like, un or reading medieval alchemy is that he already has told us that whatever he's saying is failed in misty speech. So it's kind of already off to, you know, <laughs> off to a good start. Might it please your worshipfulness to hear my silly soothfastness of that practice which I have seen in hunting of the lion green. And because you may be a paid, that is truth that I have said, and that you may for surety ween that I know well this lion green. I pray your patience to attend till you see my short rip end, wherein I'll keep my noble master's red, for while he lived stood me instead. At his death he made me swear him too that all the secrets I should never undo. To no one man, yeah, to no one man, but even spread a cloud over my words and rites, and so it's shroud, that they which do this art desire should first know well to rule their fire. Which, you know, this is the first lesson, is <laughs> to know well how to rule your fire. So again, he's more or less saying that he, he, so he <laughs> learned this. So uh, <laughs> but no, I've done this before. So, um, uh, he's more or less saying that his master or somebody told him these secrets, but he told the master, um, where he says, at his death he made me swear him too that all the secrets I should never undo, so that he would never tell the secrets that he knew. But then why is he writing this, is the question. But that's why he shrouds what he's saying um, in this cloud, he says. But those that want to uh, to know about alchemy, the first thing they need to learn is how to rule their fire, which you could, you know, if you want to go for the spiritual side of things, then that's kind of obvious what it means, and on the material side of things, it's obvious what it means. That it's about how to regulate the furnace and so on. And then it carries on, for with good reason it doth stand, swords to keep from mad men's hand, least the one should kill, no, least the one should kill the other burn. That's the sword in the fire. Uh, or 
or either do some sore shroud turn, as some have done that I have seen as they did hunt this lion green, whose colour doubtless is not so, and that your wisdoms well do know, for no man lives that each hath seen upon four feet a lion coloured green. So it's more or less, although it's called, I mean, yeah, so the whole idea is it's the hunting of the green lion, but, and some people have, like, uh, burnt themselves, or hopefully this doesn't happen, or died in hunting for the green lion. But the thing about the green lion is it's not green to begin with, which is <laughs> so, because he says, whose colour doubtless is not so, and that your wisdom well do know. So you should know that it's not green. For no man it's, lives. It's burning. Yeah, I think we can live with it. Though. And I'll just, maybe I need the, where did I put the gloves? Yeah. Yeah. But just mm. may I just leave that off? Oh. <laughs> uh, right. So where are I? For no man lives that each <laughs> hath seen upon four feet a lion coloured green. So nobody has seen a green lion. But our lion wanting maturity is called green for unripeness, trust me. And yet for quickly he can run and soon can overtake the sun. So the, green, the, the reason that it's a green line is not because it's green, but because it's a young thing, like it's immature or green. But he can overtake the sun, which is gold, and suddenly can him devour, so, so he can devour the sun, if they both be shut in one tower. If, so the tower is also, I mean, this is kind of quite common, like this is quite an easy text, because a lot of people have written about it, and. The language is quite simple, but it's like the tower is something like this, but you would have it obviously in medieval times on a larger scale, it would be on the furnace. So if you shut the green lion and the sun in the tower, then the green lion would devour the sun, the gold, and him eclipse that was so bright and make this red to turn to white. So this is a color that you could observe. Uh, and I'll finish in a moment. And this red to turn to white by virtue of his crudity, so his immaturity, and unripe humours which in him be, and yet within he hath such heat, that when he hath the sun up heat, he bringeth him to more perfection than ever he had by nature's direction. Yeah. And then it goes on for another six pages of more or less what happens next, and then what happens next, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but the kind of the important thing, and which is why this piece of writing is nice, is that in one page he's more or less said a lot about the whole practice of medieval alchemy in that it's veiled in this strange language which doesn't say what it means to say, and that it's about bringing something, which could be gold, to more perfection than ever it had by nature's direction. So it's making something more perfect than nature could make it, which is what I see as or this is not what technology does, but in some ways that's no different to what technology attempts to do. So there's no great difference between what is proposed by medieval alchemy and modern technology, but there is a big difference, and that's the kind of interesting thing. Um, but just to give an example, so it's then, he goes on this lion, that's a green lion, maketh the sun sith soon, whatever that means, to be joined by his sister, the moon, which is silver, by way of wedding a wondrous thing this lion should cause him, cause them to beget a king. And tis as strange that this king's food can be nothing but this lion's blood. And tis as true that this is none other than is it the king's father and mother. So it just kind of, you know, carries on like this. <laughs> but already we have this kind of, the, which is kind of, I don't know, like at this point it kind of makes harder to make sense of it. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> some, any questions? So we're going to put this away. And so what we're going to do is attempt, what we also need is some ice. Ice cubes in a kind of bowl or something like this. So what we do is like, and you can also feel free to attempt this yourself. Uh, what? 
the maid. Oh. Okay. Did you move to some cold water? Ah, you, you asked for me to put the ice? Yeah, I said ice. I understood you would bring a... Um, oh, okay. No, no. Need to come up very fast. No. No, cold water is okay. I think. It's just because uh, the idea is that we have... Uh, what somebody can do is, because this also needs to be very, there's a hair in there as well, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> needs to be very well mixed, so just if you find some wrong thing, like just something to stir it with. You can use this actually, but just be careful because it's glass. So, so just also so there are no lumps and it's just completely. So the idea is that we have... Should I take the hair out? No, it's okay. You can lift it. If you, if you need uh, ice, we have a neighbor friend. Mm. I think we'll be okay without the ice. Yeah? Yeah, because it's all kind of quite mm. un <coughs> improvised. Like, this is not a perfect... Setting. <laughs> so what's going to happen is we put the ammonium chloride and the saltpeter in here, heat this very strongly, so it kind of forms some vapor or spirit here, and then we somehow, using tin foil and this tube, attempt to... This is where it starts to get tricky. But need. But we'll give it a go and see what, see what happens. Because the whole idea, I mean, with the ice, what I'll do is like surround this, put this in like a bucket of ice or a beaker of ice, so it's very, very cold, which just means that it condenses a lot faster. Okay. So the idea is quite, it's more or less like when I. If I do this with like a larger setup, you can only do it outside because you need like a very strong uh, heat. Then you have this kind of like classic kind of like distillation setup, which is kind of what I've used in the, in the past. here, then you have like cooling water, which is kind of curling around, but within this kind of curl of tube, of cooling water, you have a tube, and then the distillate, what we call the distillate is coming out here. Also the same process, but it's not dry distillation, it's wet distillation, because it's wet, you would use for distilling alcohol. So it's the same thing, but you're using much lower temperature. Yeah. So what we're going to do here is just replace everything quite uh, primitively. But what I might do is need somebody... But we'll just see how it goes.
kind of a lot of money. But anyway, it's just a kind of like it's kind of easy. I don't know. In some ways, it's easy to do it on a small step, but at the same time, when you have it larger, it's kind of easier to fit everything. So you kind of need to seal everything, otherwise the vapor will just go into the air. And also it's probably poisonous. So I've done it once before this way and then more times the other way. That's encouraging. So this would be an ice, but it's kind of cold. And I'll find I think we need the water so, because I can feel that it's and it's not. But the principle is quite clear. Yeah. So does anyone have a lighter? Too much, uh, too much stuff in there. Because what's happening is also like if I'm looking here, this is just blocking. This, the amount doesn't really help us. If you know what I mean? Because it's just blocking the vapor going through. So, but you can see we have some vapor in here. But the only other thing which is kind of interesting in the experiment is to see. Because I don't know whether we can get any. There's not like enough vapor, like too much vapor is going out and not enough is getting into this to be able to distill the vapor here and maybe it's also not cold enough. But what we can also see is what, what the vapor would do to the gold and the vapor. So we'll have to try it. hopefully... Because what we see here, which is some kind of liquid, is just water, I would say. Because we didn't really go that high in terms of nothing. So we need some way. What is the... <laughs> like a 
small thread or something to kind of try and suspend them. Some Sorry? Try to bring yeah, some that'd be good. Yeah. So what we need to do? I was supposed to hang this and the only thing I do is just pull So at this scale, we're only really thinking about like a couple of drops of some kind of acid that we can... Again. <laughs> is melting, which means that, but this is kind of quite successful so far. So I'm going to try and, maybe I'll do this a bit more. What we could actually do, this, let me just think of something. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? 
Pobre. <risa> Para. Pobre. Don't try this out. And then, and, and then at the same time, <laughs> we'll just put it like at a. Is there anything which is like any. But, we're keeping the goggles on, of course. So <laughs> still, I mean, because what I've done with, or what happens before is that this will kind of puncture and then it's just you have a huge release of stuff. But it seems okay at the moment as long as it doesn't. The other thing is not to, like on this scale, it's not so bad, but not to let everything cool down too quickly. So if you have like a high furnace or something like this, like a charcoal, and then if you take all of the elements out of the, you would just leave them. Thank you. It's a cold maybe. Yeah. Basically, just to leave all the glass elements in the furnace as the furnace cools down. Otherwise, if you take them out, then everything will just shatter more or less instantly. So let's get that in there. Get that in there. <laughs> you have to also use an Australian accent at certain points <laughs> for no reason. Um, so it'll take a few minutes, and then there might be some kind of distillate, but I can see that the gold is already been dissolved by the vapour. So the spirit of the green lion has, has eaten the um, gold, the sun. Then, but I'll show you in a moment. Any questions? And you can also eat, <laughs> you can become the green lion and eat the gold leaf, because also used for like cake decoration and Indian food. But no reason. So we have the. Does anyone have? If I can eat something, which I can get that in. I can actually do it with this. Look at that. Oh. So this is. If you're probably familiar, this is. These are the tongues of the green line. <laughs> no. Um, so this is pH indicator, which indicates acidity. And so we can see, because basically, if, well, for one thing it has dissolved the gold, but just to be certain, there's not a huge amount of liquid. But we can try, it's not so easy. Oh, that's quite good. Because what we want for an acid is a very low pH. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we red. Yeah. what we have is yeah. right at the bottom of our yeah. pH is 2, so we have acid. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So we've gone from, I mean it's kind of like it's not magic obviously, <laughs> it's, it's chemistry, but you know, if you believe me, like using these elements collected from the earth, we were able to do the same process. It's just I've substituted to save time. But obviously it's like I can go out and buy hydrochloric acid and nitric acid, put them together, dissolve that gold in three seconds. But this, what is interesting for me is that you've taken, well, ideally you've taken something from the earth, but it also started off as a solid, became this kind of breath or spirit or vapor, and then it's kind of eaten the gold. But the blood of the dream, yeah, the blood is not red, it's green. 
But um yeah. That's it. So it was quite successful. I think. Great. <laughs>